Hi guys, this is Ash from Rocksled. Uh, today we've got a bit of an informal video. First chance we had to do uh, something like this. Um, just talking about the philosophy and uh, reasoning and thinking behind a fork like this. Um, and then talking about the second prototype, uh, some drawbacks, benefits, and then plans for the future basically. Um, so, the philosophy behind the fork, why did I decide to build something like this? Uh, I've always thought test company forks were good, the good ones are really good, um, but there's always room for improvement and I think because there's been so much R&D money put into telescopic forks and they're so far down that path now, uh, they kind of have to keep going with that design, um, where it's just a single person like me, just an amateur inventor, engineer, whatever you want to uh, call it, um, can really go out of their way to do things like this without being um, constrained by any rules or regulations or anything. Um, so the number one thing was to be able to use uh, just an off-the-shelf rear shock as I've got here. Um, this happens to be metric size, 230 by 65, uh, mainly just so that we could swap in and out. So if we wanted a coil shock, we could go with one. If we wanted a, an air shock, we could go with one. If we wanted a, a budget version, so this cost me, this is second hand, this Mazoki Bomber CR. So this was 220 pounds, I think, used. Uh, you can use a, a budget shock if you want to go boutique. You can use a boutique shock if you like. And the idea was that you could switch backwards and forwards with no um, real penalty to performance. Um, whereas with telescopic force, you can't always do that. Obviously, there's aftermarket um, suspension tuners like Push, Avalanche, um, trying to think of some others, you know the ones I mean, um, where you know that they do upgraded internals, but you can't always go from an air, sh an air shock or air sprung fork to a, a core sprung one and back again. You can't always swap and change, and there's very few options available really. Uh, whereas with a fork like this, effectively what I'm doing is designing the, the chassis or the frame of the fork, if you like, just like the rear of the bike, and then the, the rider gets to choose their own shock, coil, boutique, budget, um, air, whatever. Um, so what kind of features does this fork have that telescopic forks do, uh, don't have? Obviously the first one I've just mentioned, the ability to use uh, off-the-shelf rear shocks. Uh, you can use different sizes, but this just happens to be 230 by 65 because that was the, that was the one that worked. Um, bearings instead of bushings. So we've got huge bearings in this pivot point here. Um, almost no stiction at all. The only stiction you've got to overcome is the, uh, uh, the shaft stiction here. And you've got a leverage rate or leverage curve anyway, leverage ratio, which makes it e even easier to overcome. Um, you can have a dynamic offset. So the offset on this particular fork starts at 44, 45 uh, and reduces all the way to 17 millimeters, I think, which increases your trail as you move through the suspension. So um, all things being equal, if the front and rear are compressing at the same rate, well, obviously I know that's not always the case, but um, if they are, then you're Steering stability, steering slowness, um, control of the bike just, just gets better as it goes through the suspension, which is often the opposite on a telescopic fork. Um, yeah, there's a leverage curve, obviously. Um, so there's, there's only so much you can do with a, a, a shock that's driven directly by the swing arm, effectively. Um, so this is a, a starts at 2.54, I think, and goes down to about uh, just over two. Um, so not, not massively progressive, but more than enough for this core shock. I don't think I've bottomed out too many times. Um, and even when I have, I haven't been able to feel it that much. Um, yeah, and then, uh, what have I got here? The chassis or frame mentality. Yeah, so the, the, the major benefit of this is, is that it approaches the front suspension the same way the frame designs approach the rear suspension. So a frame designer won't really, they won't design or the, the shock and the damper are not part of the system necessarily. That's, a, that's an aftermarket part for the, uh, for the rider to, to suss out or sort out, or for them if they're offering a frame and shock uh, option. So they'll build the frame, design all the kinematics, and then that's it, and then you can put a, a cheap shock on there, an air shock, a core shock, an expensive shock, what have you. Um, and the same thing, I've taken the same approach with the front suspension. So we've got a single leg here, this just happens to be single leg, uh, a single swing arm, a single link, and a shock, um, and there we go. Um, so it features the first prototype. Uh, so we've got a core shock, obviously, as you can see. Uh, it's one-sided, not because 
I wanted it to be outlandish or um, to stand out just because it was simpler to make uh, and required fewer parts. Um, so I was certain that we could get the carbon structure stronger. So this is actually 50 mil, uh, nominal diameter. That's quite a big box section there. Um, carbon uh, steel tube all integrated, um, massively strong, massively stiff. Uh, and then we've got a single link here that runs on a 20 millimeter uh, axle, single bolt all the way through. Um, we have, like I said, 230 by 65 coil shock, 160 mil travel, or ju just over 164 if you were counting the curved axle path. Um, 20 millimeter through axle, that's just custom machine for this. Just a normal hub, boost hub, 110 mil wide. Um, what else have we got here? Yeah, extreme, extremely low breakaway force. So I hope you can see this on the video. Just pushing down a tiny bit on the handlebars, you can see the fork start to move. It's extremely, extremely smooth. And you can push on the seat. 